That's why he, he says that وَلِذَلِكَ كَانَ لَا يَتَصَدَّ لِلْدُعَاءِ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فِي كُلِّ عَصْرٍ سَبَقْ, سبق إِلَّا أَكَابِرَ الْأَوْلِيَاءَ الَّذِينَ خَرَجُوا مِنْ حُضُوذِ النَّفْسِ وَأَنَّ وَأَمَّا أَمْثَالُنَا فَإِنْ تَصَدَّرَ رُبَّمَا أَهْلَكَ نَفْسَهُ وَأَتْبَاعَهُ He said that is why in the past times it used to be only the major awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who used to um, sit in such a position to invite people. It was such awliya who were completely out of their selfishness, who'd completely abandoned their selfishness. There were selfless individuals who used to do this. He says as far as people like us are concerned, if they go ahead and take a position, then maybe they will destroy themselves in that position and destroy the people that are following them. Allah protects us from that. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. We are on the last session of this section of al uh, of the al anwar fi adab al suhbah of imam sha'rani so the last few adab and etiquette he mentions of the awliya of allah is the first one he says here ru'yatu nufusihim fi kulli majlisin jalasu fihi ma'a al muslimin la siyama al fuqara annahum aktharuhum dhunuban he says among their etiquette and their adab is for them to see themselves in any gathering that they attend with the Muslimin, especially if they are with other uh, seekers of the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and aspirants and awliya. They look at themselves in any such gathering as being the most sinful. So whenever they sit in any gathering, especially when it's with other righteous people, they always consider themselves to be the most sinful, full of sins in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the author says, وَقَدْ حُبِّبَ إِلَيَّ أَنْ أَقُولَ فِي كُلِّ مَجْلِسٍ جَلَسْتُ فِيهِ مَعَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي اِعْتَرَفْتُ بَيْنَ يَدَيْكَ بِأَنِّي بِأَنِّي أَكْثَرُ هَاؤُلَاءِ ذُنُوبًا وَأَقَلُّهُمْ حَيَاءً وَأَسْوَأُهُمْ أَدَبًا فَبِحَقِّ أَسْمَائِهِمْ الظَّاهِرَةِ اغْفِرْ لِي So the author himself is saying that I, what is beloved to me, some, a practice that has become beloved to me is that I say in any gathering in which I sit with other Muslims, I say that, Oh Allah, I am confessing in front of you that I am the most sinful of these people who are sitting here. I, am, I have the least haya and bashfulness. And I have the worst of character. I'm the worst in etiquette towards you. So at least by the apparent meaning of their names, forgive me. By the apparent meaning of their names, forgive me. The benefit of thinking of oneself as being the greatest sinner inside uh, is then it will keep a person away from arrogance. It will keep a person from looking down upon others. Especially uh, for people like the Shaykh who had a lot to offer, who had a lot of knowledge. He had a huge amount of understanding and profound insight into the deen. So deen, uh, the knowledge of the deen, knowledge is something that generally rises. It elevates you. And of course, that brings about arrogance in many cases. So if you don't temper that and control that with something, then it can be very, very harmful. So that's why he's saying that for us, one person to think that he is the worst of everybody who is present in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you, if you have the most sins and you'd expect to be the most distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means somebody else is closer. That means I shouldn't look down upon another person, even though I have more knowledge than somebody else maybe. I may have more money than somebody else. But at the end of the day, for Muslimin, what matters is 
what distance they are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how close they are. So he says that this is what's become believed, uh, beloved to me that I read this dua all the time. Oh Allah, I confess in front of you that I am the most sinful among these people, I have the le least haya and bashfulness and shyness and I have the worst etiquette with you. So at least by the apparent meanings of their names, by the, their apparent names, then forgive me. Of course, when you think you've got sins, you'll ask for forgiveness from sins. If a person thinks they're very accomplished, they're not going to ask for forgiveness. So that's another benefit of doing this. You can say these are tricks of the trade to get the most out of this. The trade with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I use that term. It's about getting the most profit, getting the most out of this. Then he moves on and he talks about the second adab, another adab. He says, إِذَا أَرَادُوا أَنْ يَأْمُرُوا أَحَدًا بِخَيْرٍ أَنْ يُحَرِّرُوا نِيَّتَهُمْ Whenever another of their etiquette is that whenever they intend to command another person to do something good, uh, command a virtue, brother, you should be doing this, you should do this, it's nice to go for hajj, come on, it's time for you to go for hajj. You should do sadaqah, you should give this, you should start praying, maybe you should do the hajjud prayer, maybe you should start covering, maybe you should start um, uh, doing this good deed or that good deed. Whenever anybody intends to command another person to any kind of virtue, they first yuharriru niyatahum. They first uh, look at their intention. They specify their intention. They look very. They consider their intention very carefully. Why am I doing this for? Why am I telling? What's my intention? Maybe there's going to be some problem in your intention that encroaches on your sincerity. That pollutes your sincerity, adulterates it. فَلْيَمْتَحِنْ مُدَّعِ الْإِخْلَاسِ نَفْسَهُ So anybody who considers to have ikhlas, then he should test himself. He should examine himself. He should really investigate whether he has ikhlas or not. بما, the way to do it, one of the ways he's saying is بِمَا لَوْ تَفَرَّقَتْ جَمَاعَتُهُ إِلَىٰ شَخْصٍ مِّنْ أَقْرَانِهِ فَإِنْ حَصَلَ إِنْ عِنْدَهُ تَأْثِيرٍ فَأَمْرُهُ وَدُعَاءُهُ لِحَظِّ نَفْسِهِ Maybe here he's speaking about somebody who is kind of more in a leadership position, a speaker, a, somebody who teaches. So he's saying that for such a person to test themselves the way they should look, and this can work in um, an ISOC or an MSA kind of situation as well. You know, wherever you are, if, even if it's at work and you have a musalla, you have a prayer place at work, and generally you're the person who's uh, always pushed forward to give the khutbah or make salat or or in your family for example when you have family get together and you're praying at home for example you're not going to the masjid then they always put you first everybody looks upon you as the guide because you're the most knowledgeable person maybe in your family or considered the most religious person so now you can see how widespread this is this is not just for scholars who speak in masajid or in programs or anything like this this could be in any situation how does such a person rectify their ikhlas how does one do that? He says, uh, the way they should test themselves is to think, to imagine that if the group that's listening to him, if they suddenly disperse, if they were to disperse and go to somebody else, will that affect you? Meaning if they were to start going to somebody else and getting guidance from them and leaving you and abandoning you, will that affect you or not? For Amru, if it does affect you, and you feel jealous of the other person. You now one is you feel like, you know, what did I, maybe I said something wrong or something like that, to learn from something like this. But the one is when you feel jealous, why are they going to that person for? فَأَمْرُهُ وَدُعَاءُهُ لِحَظِّ نَفْسِهِ If you do feel bad about it, then it means all of your commanding and all of your invitation, everything to the good and piety was for your own self, not for Allah. لَا إِمْتِثَارًا لِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى Not out of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just imagine that if every one of you today go somewhere else, khalas, jaw, what's going to happen? Right. So a person needs to be considerate about that. Very deep, insightful advice that he's providing at all sorts of different levels. That's why he, he says that وَلِذَلِكَ كَانَ لَا يَتَصَدَّ لِلْدُعَاءِ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فِي كُلِّ عَصْرٍ سَبَقْ سبق 
إلا أكابر الأولياء الذين خرجوا من حظوظ النفس وأن وأما أمثالنا فإن تصدر ربما أهلك نفسه وأتباعه He said that is why in the past times it used to be only the major awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who used to um, sit in such a position to invite people. It was such awliya who were completely out of their selfishness, who'd completely abandoned their selfishness. They were selfless individuals who used to do this. He says as far as people like us are concerned, if they go ahead and take a position then maybe they will destroy themselves in that position and destroy the people that are following them Allah protects us from that because our state is maybe worse than his, the state of his time and who he's speaking about may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us may Allah, may Allah grant us ikhlas and at least if we don't have ikhlas then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all those who listen and all those who benefit, may Allah allow people to benefit and grant us ikhlas and because of the sadaqah of a few people who are inspired, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also grant us refuge and grant us success and salvation in the hereafter. And then he says, another of the adab is Raddu kulli ma yatihim min maalil wulat li'anna makhlut, li'annahu makhlutun bil harami wa shubuhat. He says, they will normally reject any gifts that come, any gifts or awards or Anything that comes from the wealth of governors. Now this is talking about an, uh, generally an Islamic uh, state system. Not the Islamic state of this time, but the general Islamic system. In which you have Muslim governors. Now generally what will happen with scholars is that they will try to get these scholars on their payroll in a sense give them lots of gifts pamper them and so on so that they don't speak out against the scholars maybe whatever their intention is but he says that the adab of the awliya is not to accept any mal any wealth of the governors because generally it is mixed up in haram or at least doubtful why because they may have confiscated something it's a power position it's a position of power in which People aren't very careful. Very few people can be very careful in such positions to, to not take anything. You've just uh, seen the recent revelations of that bank in Panama and how certain heads of states have to, had to resign just because of the revelations that are made. I mean, this is talking about in this time when things are supposed to be recorded, when things are supposed to be very app apparent. But... Human deception will always be there. So you've seen how much embarrassment it's brought to so, so many people in prominent positions. So that's exactly what he's saying. He's saying that to accept from such people is haram. Uh, he, he, they would never accept because it's mixed up with haram, at least doubtful issues. Yes, there have been cases where some have accepted depending on who. The, there have been some decent individuals in the past, decent leaders in the past. Far and few, but... Few and far in between all of them, but there have been. But this is the general idea. That's why Imam Ahmad would really um, say that it was better when I had the three Khalifs to deal with who were against me. At least I won't have to uh, be forced to accept their gifts. They were all against me. They were uh, punishing me for my beliefs. And then when it was the fourth Khalif, Mutawakkil Billah, who used to uh, like him a lot, insisted he come and stay at the royal palace for a number of days and Imam Ahmed found it so difficult he, did, he couldn't eat a thing so eventually they had to send him back home because he was going to he was going to be suffering in an immense way because he just wouldn't eat anything and he said that this fitna is greater than the previous fitna of being persecuted by them now these were real people these were people who had a you know, ajib personal discipline like really well in control of themselves for a higher purpose. Unfortunately for us, we have too many lower purposes that have to be fulfilled. May Allah help us to overcome them and only the higher purpose with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that to remain the only thing. Um, based on the earlier point that I made, the author in another book, Lata'iful Minan, he mentioned something else. He says there that Lata'iful Minan Lata'if means subtleties 
and minan is the plural of minna. Minna is a gift of Allah, a divine gift. So he's saying these are the subtleties of the divine gifts. That's his book. It's quite a large book, probably more than 300 pages or so. He says that وَمِمَّا مَنَّ اللَّهُ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى بِهِ among those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has favoured me with is فَرْحِي بِكُلِّ شَيْخٍ أَوْ وَاعِذٍ بَرَزَ فِي حَارَّتِي وَصَارَ يَلْتَقِتُ أَصْحَابِي الَّذِينَ كَانُوا حَوْلِي وَاحِدًا بَعْدَ وَاحِدٍ حَتَّى لَمْ لم يَبْقَ حَوْلِي مِنْهُمْ وَاحِدٍ وَهَذَا الْخُلُقْ مِنْ أَكْمَلِ أَخْلَاقِ الرِّجَالِ He says that uh, among those things that Allah has favoured me and bestowed me with is my happiness and joy with all those shuyukh or preachers who appear in my area and then start to pick away, pick up my companions, people who sit with me from around me one by one until nobody remains with me. He says, I'm extremely satisfied when somebody does that. They're doing my job for me. Basically, if you have the right intention, then in that case, you get their reward as well. And he says that this particular characteristic is from one of the most complete characteristics of men. It's a very difficult one. The personal emotions that will come about in that regard. And generally, people will be jealous of such people or angry with such people. But he said, I'm happy with this. See, if somebody else is, mashallah, also giving some wa'ad and helping others, preaching, speaking, guiding, you're doing the same thing. It's not a business. I get more profit. You know? The idea is that you're taking people to Allah. So if you're happy that somebody else is taking people, you get that reward as well. We're both working for the same cause. We're both working for the same cause. So let him do it as well, let me do it as well. That way we engender more virtue in the community. If it's only me, there's only a certain number of people that are going to come to me. But somebody else, he's going to have a following. They, people may resonate with him because he has a different style. Da'wa, a lot of da'wah is based on style and what people are used to, what people can resonate with. So some people may find a particular speaker to be too harsh, too soft. They have these various criticisms. So the more people that are doing it, it creates more virtue in the community. At the end of the day, the benefit comes back to us. Because the virtue of the community comes back to everybody. That's why Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he used to give numerous gifts to the scholars of, his, of Kufa. He used to shower them with gifts. He says another of their adab is either akalu inda ahadin aw sharibu, whenever they go and eat by somebody or they go and drink by somebody, somebody feeds them something, gives them something to drink, cup of tea, coffee, or something like this, then they will generally make this dua. Whenever eating by somebody else, they will make this dua. Allahumma in kana ma akalnahu inda abdika aw sharibnahu halalan fawasi' alay wajzihi khaira wa in kana haraman aw shubhatan faghthir lana walahu wardi anna ashab at tabi'at yawm al qiyamah sadaqatan min sadaqatika alayna ya arham al rahimin. Because remember, there was an earlier point where he says they were very careful about halal haram. So in this case, they would make this dua whenever eating with somebody or buy somebody their food. Oh Allah, if that which I'm eating at, by this servant of yours or that which I'm drinking, if it is halal, then give him expansion in it and give him a goodly reward. And if it is haram or it has a doubt, if it is doubtful, then forgive me and forgive him. And be satisfied or satisfy on our behalf, satisfy on our behalf the people who have the rights on the Day of Judgment. Meaning, if this food or drink that I'm eating actually is owned by somebody else because 
the money was taken unfairly, deceptively, or however it was, wrongfully, then on the Day of Judgment, that's going to come back to haunt the person. So that's why he's saying that, look, forgive him if that's the case. And the people who are owed, then satisfy them on our behalf on the Day of Judgment. As a sadaqah from your sadaqat, as a charity, satisfy them on our behalf. As a charity among your charity upon us, O most merciful of the merciful ones. So they're always very careful about everything. Because you can't tell when somebody else's food where it comes from. You can tell yours. There's only so much precaution you can take without upsetting people and so on and so forth. So then they make this dua. And the last point that he makes, this is the last of his etiquette that he mentions here, is إِذَا أَرَادُوا الدُّخُولُ فِي عَمَلٍ مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ الصَّالِحَ يَقُولُونَ بِقَلْبِهِمْ أَوْ لِسَانِهِمْ Whenever they want to do any good deed, any pious, righteous deed, or they, uh, whatever that deed may be, they will generally say either in their heart or they will say with their tongue, نَعْمَلْ ذَلِكْ أَوْ نَقُولْ ذَلِكْ إِمْتِثَانًا لِأَمْرِكَ يَا مَوْلَانَا وَمَوْلَا كُلِّ مَوْجُودٍ وَأَنْتَ خَالِقُهُ And he says, وَلِهَذِهِ الْكَرِمَةِ تَأْثِيرٌ عَظِيمٌ he says among their etiquette is also that whenever they want to embark upon any good deed, they say either with their heart or they pray this, they make this dua with their tongue, that we are doing this or saying this out of obedience to you. We're doing it because you've commanded such. So we're doing it out of your obedience, O oh, our Mawla, our Master, and the Master of every existent thing, and you are their Creator. He says that this formula, this dua has great benefit, has immense benefit because you're essentially saying that look this do deed that I'm doing, I'm doing it because you like this to be done and it's something that I'm doing out of following your command. So then you're telling Allah look I'm doing it for you. And then you're saying oh our master, at the end of the day everything is in your hands, you are our master, you're in control of us and you're the master of all existent things. So let it be blessed basically. And you're the creator of everything. He said it has huge benefit, huge effect, very positive. فَإِذَا فَرَغُوا مِنْهُ And then whenever you finish doing the deed, then حَمِدُ اللَّهِ إِذَا أَهَلَّهُمْ لِذَلِكِ إِذَا أَهَلَهُمْ إِذْ أَهَلَهُمْ لِذَلِكِ وَاسْتَغْفَرُ اللَّهِ مِنْ تَقْسِيرِهِمْ فِيهِ ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتِ Then they would do two things after finishing. They will then praise Allah because Allah considered them worthy of that action. That's a bounty on its own. Then they will seek forgiveness from Allah or any shortcoming in it. Oh Allah, thank you very much for letting me do this. It's an absolute honor. And I seek your forgiveness from any mistakes I made during this hajj, for example. They would say this three times. And he says that, وَقَدْ حُبِّبَ لِي أَنْ أَقُولُ The following dua has been made beloved to me. This is something I practice, he says. Astaghfirullah al Azim min taqsiri fi kulli ibada. Adada anfasi. Astaghfirullah al Azim min taqsiri fi kulli ibada tin. Adada anfasi. I seek refuge in, I seek forgiveness uh, from Allah, uh, the Mighty, from all of my shortcomings in every ibada. I seek this forgiveness the number, uh, as the number of my breaths. So that's how much forgiveness that I seek. So it's one dua, but it's a continuous kind of dua. And then he finishes off by saying, وَآدَابُ الْقَوْمِ كَثِيرَةٌ كَمَا تَقَدَّمْ The etiquettes of this blessed group are numerous, as has passed, as we've read. وَفِي هَذَا الْقَدْرِ kifaya, But in what we mentioned, there is sufficiency. This is sufficient. We've said so many already. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen And all praise is to Allah, Lord of the worlds. That's how he finishes this, book, uh, th this uh, final section of the book. He has one small section that is left, uh, which is about the adab of dhikr. Those agreed upon etiquette of how to do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Insha'Allah that will be our final session. We'll do that in our next session. But I, I do want to mention here that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq and um, 
reward us for going uh, through this reward us by allowing us to adopt these adab and character to improve ourselves in our interaction with others in our humanity in our behavior in our conduct in our character and in our worship especially our character and conduct with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make this beneficial for us and make this a sadaqa jariya for us and also allow this to be a sadaqa on the day of judgment and a means of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may Allah reward the author abundantly for bringing these things up and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant him the highest places in Jannah al those fill his grave with nur and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also reward all of those who facilitated this class and who uh, those who have attended this class and those who listen to it wherever they are around the world may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all a part of this and make this as also a sadaqa for our parents and inshallah for the baraka and blessing of our progeny until the day of judgment wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin the point of a lecture is to encourage people to act to get further an inspiration an encouragement persuasion the next step is to actually start learning seriously to read books to take on a subject of islam and to understand all the subjects of islam at least at their basic level so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us uh, and that's why we started uh, rayyan courses so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time especially for example the islamic essentials uh, course that we have on there the islamic essentials certificate which you take 20 short modules and at the end of that inshallah you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.